Hello, สวัสดีค่ะ I just learned this hello from a t e c h e r So my name is Rachel, and uh, I recently graduated from Berkeley, and now I'm at Amazon AI. So here I'm going to introduce some machine learning basics and deep learning basics knowledge for you. So if you have questions or if you cannot see the slides clearly, just raise your hand. And if I'm talking too quick or too slow, you just raise your hand. Okay. And let's get started. So here's our outlines for today to machine learning basic class. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of machine learning motivation and math fundamentals, which are probability statistics, linear algebra. Um, they're kind of high school or uh, uh, undergrad year one one knowledge. So pretty pretty simple. And I'm going to talk about some ML methodologies um, from supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and also reinforcement learning. And also going to talk about the whole overview of machine learning overflow, or workflow. It's like from the start, from the idea scratched to the end of the production. Um, so let's get started with machine learning. So it's a it's a bit buzzword now. And uh, can anyone tell me what is machine learning? Any volunteers? <laughs> okay, you guys are too shy. Um, I Google it, and I have the idea here. So the main idea for machine learning is to estimate some function f, and we map the input data to our, our output target value, if it exists, or if it doesn't. And we have our training set, which is a training set of input value, which is the features, and we're trying to map, map it to the labels, which is like human man label it. And the goal for machine learning is given a training set, we find approximation f height and for this f. So we try to approximate this f hat with this uh, smaller f, which is our true function. And we predict the label for the new examples. And the best here measures some qualities we are going to talk about later. So here's the old ML workflow. Um, you can have the start from your training data with your labels, um, and then come to the machine learning algorithm you built. Uh, whatever algorithm or deep learning algorithm. And then if you, you are ready, you put into your predictive models and you fit in your new data and come to the prediction, which is the approximation. And here's some reason why we're doing machine learning. Um, since first of all, there are some of the program are too difficult and impossible to write using C++ or Python using like if else functions, so that's why um, we are trying, for example, we are trying to, if we are trying to do the facial recognition, we cannot write human's face, oh, this is eye, this is a nose, this is a mouth. We need to some machine learning algorithm to man auto automatically recognize it. And sometimes there are too much relevant data. For example, for the stock market data, if you want to predict, you probably have those uh, fads that's going to reach the yield rate or someone somewhere else have the earthquake, somewhere else have the gunshot, like the states is happening every day. So it's too many relevant, irrelevant data or relevant data. And so you need to remove the noise, but include the relevant data. And the third is the features probably cannot be captured by our human engineers because everyone, we have the limited knowledge. And uh, we, if we just only use our limited knowledge, we cannot build a universal models, right? But the models, they don't know everything. They see everything and they can model it. And here's something that machine learning can do. So for example, pr the product recommendation, if you guys use Amazon, you buy one thing and you get some personalization recommendation from the Amazon, you probably think it's too many ads to bug you. Um, fraud detection, if you use credit card, like if you go to states, use your credit card, and probably if you also send you email, your, decline, your credit card is declined. And also facial recognition, Autonomous driving, which is pretty popular now. Um, mostly, most of them are computer vision models are working there, but they're not fairly good yet. And also natural language processing or natural language understanding, which you want some model to understand what I'm talking about now. Also disease detection, especially useful for hospital or doctors. Any question? Okay, let's go ahead. So let's look at what machine learning cannot do. 
So uh, here's the example I borrowed from Andrew Capace, who is the director of AI at Tesla. And they're trying to do the autonomous driving using this car and using the image. So you will say, it will be probably easy, right? You have this line, you just drive on this line, and the model just see the line, and the cars follow the line, right? But you will find like those funny pictures. You'll find, mm, what is this line? Should I really follow it here? How about this one? If I follow this, will I kick it to the other car? Um, and I don't know what is happening there. Maybe it's back in Canada. They're kind of sky in here. Um, and for the traffic light, right, yellow, and green, right? It should be simple. You have right, you stop. You have yellow, you yield. You have green, you just go, right? It should be simple. And you will find there's so many weird um, traffic lights. I don't know what, how to look at this, which one to follow. Um, and this one, maybe like you can turn left, turn right, and the, uh, the back cannot go, you cannot go. I don't know what that's T meaning. Similarly, for the speed limit, we have this like a big circle. Uh, I don't know what Thailand target look like, but in states, uh, there were like, like uh, miles or kilometers. And you will see this kind of funny labels with like speed limit 9, 1 over 2. And there's like a pretty lot of time strain here. And uh, the model needs to check out the time. And if there's a time zone difference, then it will be trash. And there's like a mass function there. I don't know what's happening. Maybe some algorithm can calculate if it's really smart. So uh, what about besides uh, computation? There are also natural language understanding for sarcasm and praise, which I love those words quite a lot. So for the first sentence is, I'm a big fan of your early work. Is this a praise or sarcasm? <laughs> it's like, mm, I love your wordy work, but probably your current work is not that fancy. And the second one, your presentation will be inspiring for anyone who is actually listening. That's even sarcasm for me. Hopefully it's not my presentation. And I will have a little bit interesting video for you for the Tesla when they t test the uh, auto vapor. Um, can you help me play it? Thank you. Okay, so today we actually have had a lot of questions and comments asking what the auto wipers will actually wipe. So we have done on our new scientific attire and are going to test out all kinds of things on what Tesla wipers can and cannot wipe. Will it wipe is the big question of the day. Will it wipe? Water. Orbeez. <clears throat> Eggs. <clears throat> you didn't think I was stupid enough to use raw eggs, did you? Those were hard boiled. Sparkling water. Lemon flavor. <laughs> oh. Whipped cream. Beer. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shaving cream. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh. Applesauce. Or organic applesauce. <laughs> Mustard and ketchup. Oh. Mayo and relish. <laughs> uh, hmm. <laughs> Low sodium spaghetti sauce. Huh. <laughs> that was weird. Does it not do red still? <laughs> okay, spray. Okay, since it's too long, but if you, you can definitely go to the website and see the full video. So definitely there are lots of machine learning models that doesn't work. And so that's why it brings us to the fundamental limits of machine learning. There's no free lunch. Uh, if we don't have our data for the special case, like those traffic light 
and we probably cannot find the best model for it. And we probably need some hypotheses to define those mathematical models or the machine learning models. And there's also some bias and variance trade-offs. So there's a famous um, formula here that arrow will roughly equal to the bias plus the variance. So the arrow here is approximation arrows from the hypothesis class and plus the estimation error within the hypothesis class. So we have this bias and variance we're going to talk about more later. So uh, here are some important machine learning concepts I'm going to talk about a lot today and probably I will use different words for them. So don't be confused of those words. So we have the data set, the training set, with dev set, with testing set. And we have the feature, it will be equals to the attributes, equals to be the independent variables and the predictors. So if I'm talking about those things, they're the similar thing. And uh, the label will equals to the target, the outcomes, the class, and the dependent variables and the response. And also dimensionalities will equal, for here, will equals to the numbers of the features. And also model selection will be pretty important. And so let's get started with fundamental math. And I'm going to talk about the probability small one. Um, so for the first concept, it's a sample space, which is a, a set of all possible outcomes. For example, the AWS server is working or not, or if it's slow response, or it's just broken. And uh, if you go to Google, you query the test for search. For example, you query MLRS, or you query deep learning tu tutorial, it will return something. And these are all events, a uh, sample space for events. And the event is like the subset of the sample space. So probably your query here is an event because it's a subset, but it's not all query that Google has. And come to random variable, which is a function, and that attach a number to each of the element of the sample space. So for example, for back to the server examples, we have a server working, slow response, and the server broken. So the server working, we can attach a random class number, like two here, and slow response with one, and server broken with zero. So you can assign any number you like, just like a class. And now a little bit funnier thing, probabilities, which is a function that maps events to a real numbers. And so here are the famous XMLs that we probably need to take in mind and will be used later. So first is the probabilities of X, it belongs to either zero or one. So it's like either zero or one, it's like two binary events. And the probabilities of the whole event space will be one totally because it couldn't be something else. Like the query, if you query outside Google, I don't know what you're query for, but it's not belongs to Google. And, um, Another famous XML, if all this XI and XG, um, they are irrelevant, independent with each other, then the probabilities of the union of them will equal to the summation of all the probabilities. And the example here, if the server working is 0.999%, I hope it's so. And this is a discrete event. And there are also continuous event, for example, the income, it will be within a range, it can be on any number, um, and here's the probabilities. But remember, this is all belongs to zero and one. So here's also the famous wing diagram, which we have the probabilities of the union of X and X prime, where it calls the probabilities of X and the probability of X prime, and the minus their uh, intersections. Any question until now? Okay, let's talk about independence. Um, I kind of referred to a little bit earlier. So independence is kind of um, the two events. If like probability of x and y equals the probability of x times probability of y, then these two events are independent. So for example, the login behavior of two user, probably they are independent if they're pretty far, they're stranger to each other. And the dependence is vice versa rather than independent. We have this formula that probability of x and y will not equal to probability of x times probability of y. So for example here, on the emails, if you send to someone and the email reply should be some independence with your, if should be some dependent with your email or maybe you get a spam email. Similarly for the query, 
and new stream, our tweets, et cetera. OK, um, so let's talk about condition. So when we do the machine learning models, we probably famous with recognizing the cat and dog. So can anyone tell me what is a cat, what is a dog? No, right? Why is that? Because we don't have much information, right? And if we, I give you a larger picture, probably you can tell me, like people sit in the front probably can say uh, whether it's a cat or dog, right? If I give you a larger one, probably people in the back can also say it. So what's happening here? Um, we have this uncertainty. So previously, we have this formula, smaller picture. We don't have any priors. We don't have any um, prediction knowledge that we can predict this label Y. But here now we have a large, better um, pixel image. And that's why we can predict, oh, this is a cat. And by the way, they're in the same color on the similar grass, pretty similar. And that's why when we have the uncertainty, like for example, you win a lottery or you flip a coins, so they are pretty random and we don't have any condition. But if we are conditioning a more information, we can be more certain of whether it's a dog or whether it's a cat, right? And then we can build a classifier or a regressor for a given data. And also the famous Bayes rule, that's one of the most important thing. Um, the first row is joint probabilities. The probability of two event X and Y will equals to the probability of what X given Y times the probability of Y. Uh, and similarly, vice versa, if you switch as X and Y. And also the base rule will be the probability of X given Y is equals to uh, this term probability of y given x times probability of x, which is the probability of x, y, and divided by probability of y. Similarly, you can also switch x and y. And uh, this base rule traditionally is pretty useful for hypothesis testing, uh, especially for those statisticians. They do a lot of hypothesis tests. And um, we can determine the probabilities, whether a given hypothesis test is true or not. So it's a binary. Um, that's coming to the classification test. So if the, let's say it's a binary class, and if it's true, it's positive or negative, and you have a test data, it's positive or negative, then you have the square value. Um, I believe everyone's pretty familiar with it. You have the true positive, false positive, false negative, and true negative. Um, probably this two, white one, uh, pretty important, especially when our matrix are accuracy and we measure them a lot. Um, and for example, let's do the S test. If you have the data with choose of approximate 0.1% are S test positive, and then in your test, you detect all the infections, but your test also report positive for one person of those healthy people. So now, Come on to the question, what is the probability of having this as if the test is positive? Any recommending solution? Okay, I will just give the answer. So the probability of if you have a, um, a equals, which is positive, given the test, it's the probability of t given a equals to one times the probability of a equals to one divided by the total test positive cases, right? And then if you expand the denominator here, you will get the probability of t given a equals to one times the probability of a equals to one times the, probability, the probabilities of t given a equals to zero times probability equals to a equals to zero. And in the end, it all comes to about point, point 0.91, which is pretty tiny member. So if you are detected as an ad, don't worry, maybe the test is wrong most of the time. And how about now? If you're doing a follow-up test, a second test, and uh, then the test two reports a pro positive for about 90% of infection, and also the test two reports positive for 5% of healthy people. So what are the probabilities now to get um, positive, a real positive? So here you can see the similar calculation as before. 
And this probability is a little bit higher, which is about 35% of the total population. And uh, can anyone tell me why we cannot use the test one twice, but we are using a test two to test a new bunch of results? Anyone? <laughs> okay. But this is because uh, if we use test one twice, then these two events are not independent. And we need independence to form our rules, right? So it's like property of T1, T2 given A, or equals to property of T1 given A times T2, property of T2 given A. So that's the independence assumptions that we need to be mine on. And uh, now let's talk about um, distribution. So first is discrete distribution, uh, which is a discrete of outcomes. If it's a binary, it's like you flip a coins or the election whether it's Trump or Hillary. And if it's a multiple class, um, for example, it can be the natural processing word distribution over classes. For example, within one corpus, maybe the word the will have 0.1 possibilities to be a pair there. And um, maybe eight is much larger. And I just make up a number, they're not used. But it just gives you guys some idea of um, the multi-class discrete distribution. And also some other example of distribution, like Bernoulli, um, which is one zero. And also um, binomial which is a bunch of binomial. You can think about you have n events of Bernoulli, and uh, if you flip the coins n times, how much time of them will be had? So say there will be k times of them be had. So the probability of x equals to k will be the n k and the t times p to the power of k and times the one minus p to the power of n minus k. And for every k, which from zero to n. And also Poisson distribution, which is a event is happening. Say um, in California, what is the probably, how much time will the earthquakes occur in California? So the k can be zero, can be whatever, maybe a million number, I don't know. Um, but this is a Poisson distribution, it's also to match the discrete events. And now comes to the continuous distribution. Um, first is the uh, uniform distribution. We have some constants within an interval. Um, for example, the interval will be A or B. So the probabilities of X will be equals to X minus A or B minus A if X is B within this interval and it will be zero anywhere else. So it will be pretty useful for us to initialize all those parameters, for example, if this x is at the bias b, we are going to use later uh, in the neural networks. And we're probably going to initialize in some, like uniform or standard normal distribution. And now come to the normal distribution, which have those pretty terminating function here, and I won't read it, um, but it's pretty uh, useful for most of the machine learning or deep learning cases that we have those assumption because of the central limit theorem. And here we have the density function, we have the mean equals to mu, and we have the variance, which can also calculate over this function, and it will be the sigma square. Any question? Okay, let's talk about a bit useful thing, <laughs> the central limit theorem which assume that the sample distribution of the sample means approach a normal distribution. So if you have the same experiment a million times, maybe not a million times, a hundred times, and then probably it will, like the mean of those experiment will approximate to some means, which is will be follow the normal distribution. Yeah, x could be like any. So, so the question is, x could be any random variables in this case. So x uh, will 
Axel will be the sample means. So here, uh, and the sample okay. means will follow the normal yeah. distribution. So S, you mean S N is the sample mean? Yeah. So right. any X I here? Yeah. Will but be the sample X I could be any any random variable, but then S yeah. N approximately yeah. always approximate. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And this for each experiment, they are follow like this normal distribution of mu and sigma. Oh, sorry, sigma square. <laughs> Uh, now we are talking about linear algebra, which is a lot of matrices. Uh, the simplest one, you can say there is a scala, and you can do plus uh, times psi. You can do absolute value, the norm, and come to the vectors, um, which is, sorry, uh, a bunch of scala back together. And uh, we can also apply the same operation, like plus, times, and sine function. Also the norm, which it can be a uh, Euclidean distance, like L2 norm, or it can be LP norm, based on your matrix. And uh, here we have some uh, important formula that the norm of A, or any vectors, will be always bigger or equals to zero, and only can be equals to zero if it's at zero vectors. And also, um, any two vectors, A plus B, the norm of them will be smaller than their own norm sum. And I will explain it in a little bit later. And this is called triangle in inequality. So why is that? Think about um, using this diagram. We have this blue, uh, blue arrows as A, and uh, orange arrow as B. And if we plus them together, and the norm of them, the green line, the C, should be definitely smaller. The norm of them, the C, should be definitely smaller than um, the norm of A plus norm of B. And uh, it will be only um, have this equal sign if A and B have towards the same direction or the opposite direction. And uh, similarly for the dot product, um, this alpha here is a scalar. And if we time a scalar with our vectors, we we'll just either enlarge this vector or we condense this vectors, or vice versa. And a little bit later, if we start start all the vectors to a matrices, then we'll have this matrices operations. We have this plus, um, we have this times, so we have this C sine function, similar. We just apply on each of the union here. So you can see here, the C i j will equals to a i j plus b i j, and similarly, what's for, uh, for apply for uh, any other element uh, operations, similar to the scalar and vectors, and the multiplications. So it's like two matrices with different shapes, but they have the the columns of the first matrix will equals to the row of the second matrix, and you can apply this matrix multi multiplications. And where the CI will equals to the summation of all J of AIJ times BJ. So it's like the first row times the column, right? And it will becomes to the first union of C. Pretty simple. And a little bit, um, if we start off those row together, it will be still the same operation for each of the element here. For example, this element, like C11, it will be the first row times the first column of B. And similarly for all the IK functions on C. And before I talk about machine learning method, any questions? Okay, uh, so if no one has question, I will continue with machine learning methods. Uh, I will talk about a bunch of machine learning models from the simplest one to a little bit complex one. So 
I will just divide the machine learning into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and the reinforced learning. Maybe it's not the correct way, but it's kind of the revolution that about 20 years or 30 years ago, um, most of the researchers focusing on the supervised learning because we have limited labels. And then we come to the unsupervised learning and also reinforced learning, especially the deep reinforced learning is pretty popular now, like those alpha goals or the robotics, and it's pretty useful. Um, but I won't talk too much on it because I know that you get a speaker for that. So let's get started with supervised learning. So supervised learning is a teacher provides a training example for the students. So the teacher will correct it manually for the students. So we have two types of supervised learning. Um, the first type is classification, which you have a range of target outcome, which are categorical outcomes. So it's like countable number of outcomes that's from like one to n. And the example can be a disease detection, which is a binary classification. And uh, for the multi-class classification, the image net computation is a pretty good example. And uh, for regression, we have this uh, range of target outcome, which is numeric. So it's not integer or it's not positive member. It's not only positive integer anymore. So for example, we can focus any continuous value, uh, value like price or any product demands. So it's like can be continuous time series. We'll think about it as a regression model. Okay. And uh, here are some of the models I'm going to uh, mainly introduce today. Uh, it won't be often because machine learning is like such a big field and so many useful models. But these are most of the maybe fundamental ones or most of the important ones that I think that um, I want to share with you. So let's start with the uh, most <laughs> easier one, the linear regression, uh, the linear model. So now I only have the multivariate linear model, which means that you have m feature from x0 to xm. And what are we going to do? Oh, by the way, this m should be smaller than your training sample size. If it's bigger, then probably you won't find an interesting model. And what we're going to do is like, we're trying to approximate the weight vector from W0 to Wm, and we're trying to time this W and X, trying to approximate that to the truth Y. And here is a vector formalization that we are going to use mostly uh, in the later calculation, especially when you're using GPU. And the advantages for linear regression is that you can add as much feature as you want if you have, and you can reduce it to as much other as you want. Uh, maybe it will be overfitting. And that the disadvantages is that probably if the two features are highly correlated with each other, say the correlation is 0 0.9, and then if you suddenly remove one of the features, then the weights will suddenly increase a lot. So it's not that stable. Think about that. If you have two features there and you remove one, and they're highly correlated with each other, and you remove one, and then the other ways will be double, right? And so this is a basic idea of it will be sensitive. And if the new data come in, and probably it will give you a um, not good result. And the next model is KNN, K nearest neighbors. It's pretty simple. So first you need to do is you need to design define your distance matrix. It can be L2 norm, LP norm. So it's like a distance within some space. And then you give the model a um, data point, a point. And you want to know whether it belongs to, for example, here is like a plus or it's a circle, it's a triangle. So here is a point. And uh, what can trying to do? It's trying to find the K nearest neighbor or the circle. So for example, here, um, we have this k equals to around five. And so we draw this circle and include five training samples in it. And you will feel there are like three triangle, one circle, and one plus. And so the model will say, okay, 
Because of the majority vote, we will say this point will be classified as a triangle class. So this is the basic idea, pretty simple, straightforward. And normally, um, researcher keep it the k equals to five to find their neighbors, uh, but you can also go to ten. And uh, remember, this k should not be a multiple of the number of the class. So, um, for example, if you have this number of class equals to three, and this k should not equals to either six or nine, then you probably will have tie. Think about it, if you have like six example here, and if two of them in each, what, what do you want to classify for? So there will be like tie in it. And similarly, the assign will be based on the majority vote. And the advantages for KN is first is no parametrics. So the model doesn't need to define any set of big surface numbers of parameters, like the linear model, you need to assign like for example M feature to it. But now we don't need to assign any parameters. And also this model is pretty lazy. You don't need to train anything. You just throw some test data and test it. But it also uh, suffer from a bit of disadvantages. So the first is the space complexity and prediction time will be on. It will be on growth with the training data. So if you have like a billion training examples uh, for the KN model, you need to go through this one billion this time. And probably not that good for the parallel training. Uh, what happened? Okay, sorry about that. Um, but I will continue. So the KN also suffers from curse of dimensionalities. So what is curse of dimensionality? Anyone know it? So the definition, I also go it. It's as the number of the features goes much higher than the model, th the amount of data you will need to will be also linearly grows, uh, sorry, exponentially grows with uh, the number of features. And uh, before SVM, any questions? You guys are so good. <laughs> I felt by myself. Like I always raise my hand and ask lots of stupid questions. And the professor will know me, definitely, because I ask too many stupid questions. Um, but this is also a good thing for me to learn. So you said that complexity grow with big O of some kind of number? Yeah, the, pro um, the model complexity will, uh, will grow with ON. So like this just, N. This ON. Yeah, the ON will be the training data. Yeah. What is the K for mm. this data set? OK. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, what should we K? What should we choose K for? Yeah training the models, right? Um, to be honest, I don't have a good answer, but normally I will try between five or 10. And sometimes if you have a large training data set, you can throw a, a larger number, um, but it will take <laughs> pretty long time to train. <laughs> yeah, good question. Okay, great, um, I will continue with SVM. Um, so this kind of, this model is pretty popular about 20 years ago. And my mentor, Alex Mola, who is expert on it, and he sent me here and asked, what do you want me to tell uh, the students about SVM? He said like, mm, it's an important example, but maybe neural network is more important, but I still want to mention it here. So here is a linear SVM. What I'm going to do is like, now we have this two class. Oh. We have this two class, which are either circle or, or this plus. So we want to separate them, right? And they're linearly separate by now. So we can have fit different uh, millions of hyperplane within this two class. But which one should we choose? And SVM is 
a linear SVM is a model helping us choose which hyperplane is the best one. So what does it do? First, we have this support vector. So what are the support vectors? So these are the vectors that if you use the width w times this vector x, it will equal to either minus 1 or equals to 1. So to separate these two class, positive or negative. And we also have this definition of decision boundary, which is the hyperplane. It, it will be the w times w is transpose times to x equals to 0. So this will be the decision boundary. And what are we going to do? We're trying to maximize the margins between the support vectors. So the support vector are the close one to the hyperplane um, for each class. And we want to maximum their margins and for this linear SVM. Pretty simple, straightforward. And here are some examples. We classify dog and cat again. So first we can cut a hyperplane. And if we include another dog, we can maybe turn the angle a little bit and classify it, add more, uh, turn more. And so until it converges with all the training data at that one at in a time, so we can um, predict the convergence with like r square plus one divided by rho squares. Uh, I didn't really read the proof myself, but it's pretty um, important and interesting. And my mentor again, Alex Mola, is an expert on it. Uh, and what are we going? What, what else we can do to do is we can have some um, margin splitting the classes. And then we can have some allowance. So for example, we have this uh, line here. We can cut this dog to two parts. And this is the only case. We will also cut the cat to two parts. And then here's like some allowance that we can adjust it, that we allow this weight and bias within this uh, range. So it's still OK. And it's still the, maybe the best SVM we have. Any question? OK, um, let's talk about no linear SVM. So what about if two class or multiple class is not linearly separable? What we can do? We can apply some kernel functions. So say, for example, this graph here. We cannot cut any line here, right? Maybe we can draw a circle in the middle. But for a machine, probably they don't know what is a circle, what is a triangle. So what we can do? We can increase the dimension from x1, x2 to some z1, z2, this 3 to this 3D part. And then we can cut a hyperplane unit. And the machine definitely knows how to do it. So this is the one of the example of the kernel. So uh, some, cover, uh, some common kernels here. We have the linear kernel, um, which is xi transpose times xj. We also have the polynomial kernels which equals to 1 plus xi um, transpose times xj and to the square of the polynomial orders. We also have the RBF kernel, which is kind of Gaussian kernel. And we apply the normal function for this xi and j and take this as the uh, distance functions here, which is exponential to the minus of the, nor uh, the L2 norm of xi and j divided by the variance times two. Also, we have the sigma kernel, um, which is the hyperbolic tangent function for the beta times the xi transpose xj plus another beta. Any question? <laughs> Are you uh, you uh, present that four functions, right? Yeah. Yeah, and how what what would what would be the guideline to choose any of those uh, functions? That's a good question. That's definitely a good question. Mm. To be honest, I usually people will choose RBF as a default one since the normal distribution assumption is so powerful. Uh, and if you know secular and people use RBF a lot. 
And for the other kernel, like the Sigma kernel, people use a lot in your network. And I don't know linear kernel, polynomial kernel, but you can definitely give a try for each of them. But these are all the, not all of the kernel available, but most common one here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here are the advantages and disadvantages for SVM. So the advantages is like, you can design any kernel function for the models. You customize it, you choose a distance functions, either it's a Gaussian or it's a linear, and you name it as a kernel, and you map the learning text to a higher dimension, like the previous case I just showed you, map 2D to 3D. And then you can apply a linear SVM classifier to classify and just cut it. But it also suffers from a lot of disadvantages. So for example, it's not that memory efficient. So you need to support all the previous support vectors. When you cut one line, you include example, you remember it. You include another example, so you cut another line. So you need to remember all of them. And it will grow with the size of training data. And the, which also leads to the second disadvantages. It's computational super expensive, and uh, it will not be appro appropriate for the parallel training. And another models are decision trees, which are series of yes and no questions about the input that are answered in questions. So I will give you examples. Um, the famous Lutus dataset. We have this feature, a pad of width. Um, and this condition is, is smaller or equals to 0 0.75. And if it goes to left, which means it's a yes, goes to right, it's a no. And how do we decide this feature? Why we split using this feature? And then that's entropy come in. So you can see that this entropy comes to 1.58 around and which uh, have a sample of 105, and they split with yes and no, which have sample 34 and 71, and those two numbers should come back to this 105. And for the rest of the split, it should also go to class until all the value in the same um, square are belongs to one class. So to be specifically, how do we split this node? We have this important formula in information gains. For example, we can use entropy as those information gains. And uh, this is the entropy formula, which is um, the entropy of uh, any uh, class here will be the minus of the summation of all the events i, all the classes, features i times the probability of i times the log, or, or two log of the, sorry, log two of the probability of i. And uh, we want to maximize um, the entropy between the parent, the parent and the child. So the parent might have some entropy and the child might have some entropy. We want to maximize it to make sure that this feature split will give us the maximum entropy and we'll split using that rather than the other maybe paddle hat. Uh, so for example, in the binary case for this entropy, so this P will be belongs to like zero and one. And in the binary case, if it's a zero for one class, and so which means all the samples belongs to the same class, so all positive or all negative. So the entropy will be zero. So nothing, there's no information that this data set provided me. And uh, if the entropy is one, which is a maximum, and you will see there's a phenomenon that the, the sample will either belongs to uh, one or zero with 50% of probabilities. So 50% will maximum the entropy for binary classification. The decision tree, the advantages like the spl splitting procedures can. Ah, my bad, sorry. I go too far. OK. 
Okay. So the spleen procedure can go iteratively at each child node until the end node. So until the end of the square, you can see there's no split here, which means maybe most of the samples that belongs to one class or there's some allowance for one example as an outlier. And um, so the procedure usually stop at certain cr criteria to prevent overfitting. So we cannot really split um, each of the box to the end and that might be overfitting for this data set because maybe next time and there's a weird notice coming in with pedal of like a hundred, but it's still positive, it still wants to go to the left. So we are still want to keep some noise or some allowance within each of the squares before we split it. Am I clear enough? Any questions? To reach a certain criteria, right? But what is the criteria to stop? Okay. The question is like, um, when we do the split, when should I stop? And in most of the case, you will set up the criteria based on your training data set. And um, for example, if here is a binary, and if your training data set is pretty small, then you probably will have not that much allowance. Maybe like 1% like for the for this box, it belongs to a um, positive class, and the other rest of them are belong to a negative class. So probably you're going to stop the training because you don't want to overfit it too much. Um, but the criteria is also depends on you. It's a hyperparameter. You can tune yourself when you train the models. That's why mm, people tune a lot to do the decision tree. And that's why it's too slow. Every time we train, try different set of parameters. Thank you. Okay. Aww. So the advantages of decision tree. So firstly, it's easy to interrupt anyone look at the tree. They can understand whether it's go to left or go to right. And uh, it's super flexible expressively. Um, and sometimes it needs less feature transformation because if you apply some feature transformation, maybe you scale it, you normalize it, it doesn't really do anything to the split. It will still calculate back to the same entropy because you are using the probabilities here rather than some um, scalar value. And uh, the disadvantages here, as what I said, is super easy to get overfit if your data set is pretty small and if you split based on specific value and if you have some outliers coming, which means not all outlier, maybe outlier for current training data set, but not in general. And it probably will fit for this data set, but not the general case. And uh, next thing is ensemble method. We know that tree is pretty easy to be overfitted. So probably we can assemble a bunch of trees together. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The question is that whether we need to normalize the discrete tree or not, or discrete trace features or not. And uh, the answer is no. So that's what I said that you don't need to do a lot of feature transformation here. Because think about that. If you have this pedal width and the pedal height for other features, they're of different scales. But when you split each of the features, you are using this information gain this entropy functions with this probability. And it doesn't matter a lot with the value of them, the each of the features. So you don't need to scale each of the feature to the same range, like between minus one and one, etc. And what if the data is so highly skewed? Mm. Let's say it's left, so left skew or right skew. Mm. Is it necessary to make it like uh, normally skewed? Before fit into decision tree or not? Or you mean scale is like for one feature, it scale to some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. From my experiment before, I don't really to any parameters or any features, do any feature scaling or normalization for the features. 
but it might help. Um, I will check that for you. But for my knowledge, I don't think I do any normalization before. All right, thank you. Good question. And ensemble method, which are pretty popular, especially like uh, three years ago on Kaggle, like the data data set computation that most of the data board are being take part by those ensemble method like ActGBoost or Random Forest. So what is ensemble method? You learn multiple models and you combine the result together based on other majority vote for the classification models or the averaging for the regression models, <coughs> which means you can train, for example, um, 100 models, and if it's a regression, and you, you predict on uh, using these 100 models and using regression line for this 100 models, get a mean for them. And if it's a classifier model, you will get the majority class for this 100 models result. And uh, what it does do, it will reduce the variance, so it won't be too much overfit. Since for each of, think about each of the uh, decision tree, it will be overfitted to some of the features. Um, we're going to talk about later, that's it's like the random forest. Um, but what they do is like reduce overfitting for each of the models, since each model is kind of biased. But think about it in this way, we have a bunch of people in this room, and each of us have our specific set of knowledge. And now I want to know, for example, what is the age of President Trump? Anyone know it? Really? I don't know it either, never mind. Um, but probably someone in this room know it and uh, they're too quiet. And that will be, well, this is not a good case for majority vote, but we'll have like some prediction. For example, each of us, like I will predict some 17 years old and probably someone will predict 18 years old. And then we'll average the result, probably our bias will towards the truth. And the common type for the ensemble models, we have the bagging which is bootstrap aggregating. And the example will be random forest, and I'm going to talk about uh, in pretty soon. And also we have the boosting method, and it's pretty popular. It's kind of to apply the model one by one sequentially, rather than the, uh, the bootstrap aggregating, it's kind of combined, do the parallel training and combine the result together. So the boosting is kind of have some gradient descent to adjust the models one by one sequentially. And uh, the advantages for a sub model, it will increase the diversity through the random selection of the training data set and the subset of features for each of the trees, which means it will stabilize the predictions by averaging out the result of the majority votes to reduce the variance. And um, the disadvantage is that it's much more expensive to train Simple that previously you are just only two one trains, two the parameters for one trace. And now you need to two a hundred, even a thousand trees. And that that even can take parallelly, but you probably need some par powerful GPUs or powerful machines to train it. Or if you train one by one, you will wait like own times compared with the model you are going to train. So uh, I'm going to talk specifically the random forest algorithm. What they does do, it's like draw a random bootstrapping sample of size n. So you have a training data set. You will random choose which replacement of sample n. And you will grow a distribution tree from the samples. And at each node, you randomly select the features rather than all the features. So to avoid overfitting in each of the split, you only select random select subset of the features. And this D usually uh, we set it to be the square root of P, where P is the total feature size. So in each split, you choose this D feature and you run the information gains knowledge or the entropy knowledge. Um, and to find the highest entropy that you gain, and you split a node by maximize the information gains. And for each of the tree, you do the same procedures. You random sample a uh, size n, and these different samples should should can be uh, have some like um, union with each other. Sorry, have, can be have some joints of each other, which means that your sample is a replacement, and uh, that makes the 
uh, reduce the models overfitting and uh, increase the a little bit noise to it. So here's a diagram for whatever we do here for each of the tree. Uh, we produced whether it's class A, class B, class A, etc. And since it's a classification method, we are going to take the majority row. Or here we have two class B, and then we'll produce the final class to be maybe class B. And the third step, as what I say, is like you repeat the step one and two t times, where t is the number of trees that you get, and then finally you aggregate them together. Uh, before I talk about the neural network, any questions? Good. Yeah, okay, so question is, how do I decide what tree should I choose? How many trees should I grow? Um, there are two things uh, you already think about. First is like, how many compute do I get? If I only get a CPU, probably I won't choose too large T. Uh, the second thing is like, how much data do I get? It's like, if it's a large training set, and probably I will train over already a large data set, and probably I won't choose the T to too large because it's already generalized enough. But you already, mm, I would said to be a hundred sometimes for the, for a data set with like 10 millions of training data set. Um, and I you already tested with a thousand and it doesn't give us a better, give me a better result. So sometimes you can start with T equals to 10. And then if your data set is large, you can try uh, grow this T a little bit to see whether your model gets some better result of accuracy. Um, but you already, even if you get a better result of accuracy, you're probably going to overfit too. Yeah, the T, I already started with 10 for my data sets with like 10K examples. Um, but you can also start with five, so it won't take too long time if your data set is not huge, it's like not millions of grow. And you can start with something small, simple, and you can try to increase that a little bit and see whether you, get, you can get some improvement later. Because even though you have maybe a thousand trees, sometimes it won't help. Because the trees will do the similar thing if you have a limited amount of features. Say if you only have 10 features and some you only and you only random sample like three features from this 10 feature. And when we do a splitting, this is a, a thousand tree, maybe a hundred of them are doing the similar thing. Yeah, yeah, you are right. So what I'm going to do, I have this like total training data set and I random a sample, a subset of the training data set for one tree training. And then for the second tree, I also random sample another uh, limited amount like size end of the data set to train the set end. But this two data set can be have some duplicate some examples in it, but it doesn't matter, right? Because we are random sample, their probabilities are the same. So it's just to inject some noise into the training. Yes. Okay, neural network. Um, I believe it's one of the, the powerful model set we have nowadays. It's kind of a state of models. Most of them are using neural networks as a convolution or recurrent. So it is kind of stack of linear models. So we have this input neuron, which are our features. And for linear, for linear model, what we are doing is like, we only have one neuron here and there's no activation function. We combine the feature, have the weight, which are the edge, and we have the edge times all the features and get a result of output y and we combine this y with the choose y to see whether there are difference. So what neural neural network do is it has multiple layers. So it has multiple neurons in one layers, and you stack them together. And you train a different bunch of weight, and then you apply different uh, sorry same activation function. So activation function will inject the no linear linearities, 
for this training. So remember linear model, you only have weight times the features and to get a result. But for the neural network, you add a no linear leverages for each of the nodes here for different layers. And then if you get this first layer, you can also combine all the layer results together to the second layer until to the end, you compare the output neurons, the result with your choose. And then you back propagate to it. So we find that different for the first neuron, second neuron, and uh, we have the waist gear, you get the gradients, and back propagate the arrow to the front. So you kind of trying to adjust a little bit at each of the layer and to see whether the weight can adjust and it, when you apply the new input features, it will towards to the choose one. Any question? I will talk about it much more in tomorrow's section for the deep learning. Do you have um, any question? Yeah. Any question? Okay. So, uh, so no linear transformation we have mostly are thick mode and RADU, which are also hyperbolic tangents. Um, I'm going to talk about later for why we are using each of them later. And unsupervised learning. Do I have any slides? I can talk about in that because they are quite different. Okay. But I still have a lot. Okay. okay. So um, I will just stop here. I guess you guys are probably hungry or bored of my presentation. Uh, and I'm, we, we are going to consume later since I still have a lot of time.